Hi, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Terrell, uh, and I've got my colleague uh, Fred here. Uh, and today, uh, we're going to mix it up a little bit. Uh, a little bit of kernel for the people in the audience that like kernels, uh, and also a little bit of uh, data science and analytics for, for those that like that. Um, the, title, the, the work today we're going to talk about is called Provenance Aware Integrity Monitoring uh, with Linux Security Identifiers. Um, this work was done uh, Fred and myself uh, in collaboration with some uh, great folks at uh, Penn State University, Aditya, Raul, Eddie, and, and Trent. Um, but first, a little bit about us. Uh, Fred and I have actually worked for IBM Research uh, for about eight years. Um, we uh, uh, work on uh, some open source projects. Uh, we're maintainers and contributors to two, two projects in particular. Uh, one is uh, called Syslo, um, and the other is called Falco Security. Uh, Falco Security is a runtime uh, analytics uh, tool, um, and uh, so we actually use some of Falco inside of the, the Syslo um, uh, project. Uh, we're sort of passionate about uh, program understanding, so understanding what a process is doing um, and sort of trying to apply semantics to that to be able to to better understand that um, so that we can make better decisions and, and, and um, understand security alerts and, and things like that, um, ultimately making the security analyst job a lot easier. Um, so we enjoy, uh, you know, cloud native security research. Uh, we've done some systems and software security, uh, cyber deception, um, and, uh, and of course, some security engineering and data science. Um, so we're gonna mix a little bit of each of that uh, into today's talk. Um, but today's talk's really um, about um, you know, provenance tracking. So this idea of essentially uh, being able to, to track through a, a set of processes and understand how, how data is moving through them, how, how control flow is moving through those um, to be able to uh, identify multi-step multi attacks. And we're gonna do this through augmenting provenance um, graphs uh, with security. And so we're gonna talk really about um, data abstraction uh, and uh, look at this system provenance graphlet um, that, uh, which really is a data structure that sort of compactly uh, creates, allows us to do provenance tracking. And then we're gonna overlay or fuse in security labels on top of that, um, you know, to be able to, um, to identify where there, are, there might be some in integrity issues. Um, and then show some security analysis uh, on top of that. Fred, who I like to affectionately call the demogog, or the, the demo god, is going to uh, show uh, some of that uh, through, uh, through a demo later on. Um, but first, our first love is sort of runtime observability. Um, and runtime observability, uh, especially in a Linux system, uh, can be really challenging um, because the collection of that is typically at the system call level. Um, and so um, it's almost like trying to collect PCAP for a large network. Um, it leads to a lot of, you know, sort of rule-based analytics. Uh, it's really hard, difficult to store. It's really hard to, to analyze. Um, and so our goal uh, with all this work is really to be able to enable data science on top of uh, system telemetry. And we do this in, in two ways. One is we focus on, on data abstractions uh, and interpretability. So essentially raising up from this really granular uh, system call level um, up into something uh, that we can deal with, that we can provide context to, um, and so that we can we can do better better analytics, and then around that, um, essentially providing um, you know sort of an open stack uh, for system security and data and data science. Um, and so, going uh, forth with the sort of this multi-level data abstraction, um, I like to call this the straw. Um, and so the idea of, uh, uh, as one of our colleagues always used to say, of sort of collecting telemetry, uh, system telemetry, is taking a grapefruit and trying to shove it through a straw. And so to do this well, you can either try to increase the straw size or you can shrink the grapefruit. And what we're trying to do here is, is shrink the, the grapefruit. So if we look at the left-hand side of this, um, we get these sort of high frequency system calls. Uh, and what we want to try to do uh, is, you know, sort of create a more of a, a behavioral abstraction from that, uh, reduce it down. Um, and we do this through, uh, you know, creating sort of a relational uh, or object relational uh, data format, which we call Syslo. We'll take a, a look at that, that quickly uh, in a slide or two. Um, so this allows us to sort of reduce the amount of system calls that we're looking at. 
Uh, and then we can take that and, and form it into uh, what we call behavioral graphlets. And so as we move from, from left to right here, we're reducing the amount of data, but we're also increasing the amount of context and increasing the amount of state that we can do. And then once we, once we do that, we can then do you know, analytics, um, you know, TTP tagging. We, can, we have a framework where you can sort of create all of these different analytic plugins that you like uh, so that you can do, um, take your favorite AI algorithm, um, do, do securing analyst analysis, and it comes out uh, uh, you know, a lot less uh, noisy and a lot, um, a lot more sort of fully semantically useful um, out, out the right side. Uh, so just to, to give an overview of the architecture, um, um, on the left-hand side of this um, work, we have uh, what, what we call the, the collector. Um, and these all go into your, your Linux systems um, as, as agents. Um, it's built, our work is built on top of uh, the Falco uh, work, which is, a, which is a library that essentially allows you to have a driver um, that can link into the kernel. Um, and uh, essentially through eBPF or kernel module or, or core eBPF, you can collect uh, system call information uh, and push that up into user space. Um, and then we have uh, what's called the collector, um, which can then take that, that raw data, convert it into, into Sysflow data, and then we can stream it into what's called the, the Sysflow processor, which is essentially a, an analytics pipeline, uh, which lets you build different uh, analytics. It has a policy engine inside of it. Um, it has a graph engine, so we can build graphlets, and, uh, and um, also we can build sort of custom plugins uh, you know, to do graph embeddings, uh, analysis, and things like that. Uh, once the data gets uh, shipped off that host, uh, it can um, be done in several different ways. We have a, a whole sort of data science stack um, that can run on it. And Fred's, I'll actually show uh, you know, some of that through some Jupyter notebooks. Um, but we have different storage models where we can store it in you know, S3, uh, Elastic, or Druid. Uh, we have a data processing um, pipeline with different SDKs to be able to manipulate the data, do, do analysis, and things like Python and Go. Uh, Fred will show that as well. Um, and then we have a Jupyter, Jupyter notebook, as I was mentioning. Um, and all of this is, is again, to, to get a better understanding of the data, to be able to build um, an analysis tools and go beyond you know, rules um, to be able to, to do some, some fun stuff with the data. So if you love data and, and just different, different things like that, this is a, a fun project. Um, so I'll briefly go into uh, the Syslow uh, data format. Um, for those that are familiar with, with NetFlow, um, it's one of, my, one of the first big data sources that I worked with in my career. Um, and it's really uh, about sort of taking PCAP data or, or raw packet data and uh, you know, sort of uh, merging them into, into, into session flows uh, that can be then are a lot smaller and, and able to, to analyze. Um, and so uh, Sysflow sort of takes uh, you know, sort of some of that uh, in terms of, of, of its ideology. So uh, it takes system calls, uh, raw system calls, and then lifts that up into a behavioral uh, sort of uh, telemetry, which captures uh, how a process interacts uh, with its environment. So how it interacts with other processes, how it interacts with the file system, how it interacts with, uh, with the network. And you can build uh, essentially uh, these graph-like structures from that. Um, it's container aware, um, and it uses flow-centric uh, analysis or semantics for system analytics. And we'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a minute here. Um, so here's uh, just an example of, uh, of what Sysflow does and what it looks like. Um, there's basically three types of objects in, in Sysflow. Uh, there's entities, which are basically uh, you know, the particular objects that uh, are going to either perform actions or have actions performed on them. So things like processes, uh, files, um, containers, uh, and you know, Kubernetes uh, pods. And so those are shown in green in this diagram. And then um, we also have uh, events um, and flows. So events are things that are, are point in time happenings. Uh, so for an example, creating, cloning another process, executing another process, um, and they're separated out because of their importance in terms of time order. Um, and also uh, flows, um, which are also in purple here. Um, we have things like network flows and file flows, which is, is that will uh, establish sort of a session of an interaction with either another uh, network end or a file uh, end in terms of you know, reading or writing to that. And though all of those sort of system operations are 
combined and, and compressed into, into, into single, single records. And then as you can sort of see from here, um, you can start seeing sort of this graph-like structure um, that, uh, that we can create, giving that context that's really important to be able to do security analytics um, and identify exactly what's going on uh, in your network. Uh, so the format, um, uh, this is just a sort of an overview, similar to what I said in, in the last slide. Um, we have you know, process. Uh, the, a lot of the, this thing is very process centric. Um, and so for each thing, we have like a, a, uh, we have a, a, an event and a flow. So we have a network event, um, a network flow, which would show you uh, and certainly the, the hosts and things like that that the, pro the process is interacting with. We have a process event, which would you know, show you things like uh, process cloning, process exiting, process execing, and a process flow, which sort of maintains the status of the process in terms of how many threads it has, running all of those types of things. Um, and then we have uh, essentially uh, your file flow and your file events for deletes, unlinking reads and writes and things like that. Um, and uh, so there's a whole uh, uh, spec on this actually on the, on the website, um, but this just gives you sort of an idea of the various um, you know, types of objects that we have. And then we can, like I say, build this um, into, into graphs and, and do analytics on top of it. Um, and this is an example uh, of, an, uh, of a Sysflow trace using uh, the, uh, a tool called Sysprint. Um, the idea here um, is that we have a, a server and, and a client, and the server and the client are, are interacting with each other. Uh, and each uh, you know, sort of row in the table um, shows a, a, a different uh, Sysflow uh, record. Um, key points here is that it holds all of the, the information about, for example, a process. So you know, things like uh, PIDs, thread IDs, uh, process name, uh, things like that. Uh, it's object relational, um, so if we see this blowing up net, net flow, um, it has all the information about the net flow and then it points into uh, the process, uh, which in turn points into a container if there is one. Um, and so this helps us you know, do compression. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, one of the other key points here uh, is the op flags, uh, which is like, I guess, the, the fourth column. Uh, that shows the operations um, that are being performed in that particular record. Um, and this can have one operation or multiple ones. So for example, in the first record, the server is execing. Um, so it, uh, it has uh, that, that single exec operation. Uh, whereas in the third record, um, that's actually a, 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 a reading flow where it's reading the libc.so file. So we have an open, open, which is the O, a read, and then a close. Um, and so you can create sort of using these, these operation flags, um, you know, different events and combine them, combine them in different ways. So from that, uh, the sysflow graph, or sorry, the sysflow, we can then now create uh, provenance graphlets. Um, these aren't just sort of, uh, sort of exploding graphs where, where each, uh, each node is a, is a single event or a single entity. What we're really trying to do here is create um, uh, behavioral graphs, uh, whereby um, each node is sort of a coalescing of, of behaviors. Uh, so for example, in the, the graph on the, the right here, uh, we have an HTTP server. Uh, for those who are familiar with Apache, typically you will have you know, sort of a root, a root process, um, which would be at the top, uh, and it has a set of workers um, that it will uh, deploy uh, and, and clone. Um, and so instead of cloning you know, nodes for each of them, we can actually uh, you know, coalesce them based off their behavior. Um, and then uh, essentially attach in, uh, you know, the files that they're interacting with, uh, and the networks that they're interacting, uh, the network objects that they're, they're interacting with, um, into a label directed graph, um, where events are are, are labeled as edges uh, that associate to to uh, pro process nodes um, and to their um, to either another entity like a file or a, a network flow, or sorry, a, a network endpoint. Um, and the like. And so we, then we can use the, these provenance graphs to essentially do root cause analysis, uh, which Fred will show uh, um, and also talk about uh, you know, doing integrity uh, on top of that. So I'll pass it over to Fred. Hello, hello. Hello? Yeah. So um, given all the background that Tara has introduced about how we built those provenance graphs, 
Uh, now we talk about uh, the main scope of this talk, which is how can we leverage security identifiers, you know, the semantic of security labels, labels that exist um, in the kernel, uh, in the operating system to allow us to go beyond um, low level sort of rules uh, for detecting security relevant behaviors in Linux. Um, so what we did here um, in this um, work that is in progress, um, we took um, our base to build those graphs and we extended it with the collection uh, of uh, security labels um, from basically collecting the types uh, from SC Linux. And we augment, um, we augment our telemetry with, uh, with that semantics. And uh, the approach is very lightweight, as Sarah, Sarah was describing. There is no penalty really on the, on the performance almost. Um, it's, we tried to aim for portability, so that's why we chose to implement the prototype in eBPF. Um, and in order to define what we call integrity walls or boundaries around the different process behaviors, uh, we use uh, the mandatory access control labels. Um, there's one caveat here on this uh, architecture that you see here. Uh, we need uh, a way to translate uh, the security identifiers, the SIDs, into the labels proper. And today, uh, we are, our current prototype leverage a Cray probe on the security SID to context function. So this is something that we're gonna table to the end of this talk. We're gonna talk about potential, um, I guess, work that we could do, or perhaps extensions to the kernel that could make this uh, more streamlined uh, so that we could co collect this, um, you know, do this translation directly when we are collecting the packets, um, the events into, the, you know, into our eBPF driver. So right now, the way we do the translation, we create this hash table, uh, this label map, that essentially we are hooking to the function when there are calls to this function and we cache those labels. And then in user space, we, we read those labels. So that's the caveat here. So we have to have seen a call to that function, have had to have seen an access to that file in order to have the label. So what we do, we do a bootstrap on the kernel. So we do like a scan, we load this hash table, and then we do the, 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 the mapping. So this is not our final solution. What we want to do, and we're gonna talk in our last slide, is how we could actually make this in line with the collection of the packets with the system calls. So what we do here, uh, at the end of the day, we extend those graphs with the semantics um, that uh, we can you know, carry with the types. So we're essentially collecting from SC Linux the types of the binaries of the files, right? So for, uh, for the files that we have in the file flows, we have uh, the, uh, the uh, the, the SC Linux types, and also for the processes, we have also the type of the binary associated with that, those process nodes. Um, there's something that we do around also collecting the entry points uh, of the basic blocks and so on, uh, but that's beyond the scope of this talk. The idea is that we want to associate with those types these concepts of high integrity, low integrity, this idea of potentially victim process, and this idea of objects that could potentially be controlled by advers adversaries. So basically, uh, allowing us to um, rule detection in terms of first security principles as opposed to knowing concrete values of a specific file or a specific process name. So to motivate this approach, we're gonna talk, look at this um, shell shock scenario where we have this vulnerable Apache web server that is vulnerable, um, it's, it's configured in a way in CGI mode and is vulnerable uh, against the shell shock uh, vulnerability. So an attack can actually attack this server, you know, write a file to the file system, for example. So it's a remote control execution vulnerability. And on the other hand, <clears throat> you have uh, this cron job and you have this slop admin that has, you know, written a com job that backups the server, so the contents. And here you see, for example, that's the Linux label for the content type uh, for this file that gets written to that folder, um, to that directory. So the uh, the, uh, the slop admin has potentially uh, written his rsync script in this way and has also left, you know, um, has <laughs> left the dot here, uh, the period uh, in his path. So when it happens that when he launches this script inside in the context of this directory, instead of calling, uh, you know, the actual um, rsync uh, of the operating system, it's calling this a script that wraps rsync. 
and then you know, it mounts the attack. So it's a multi-step attack, and there is you know, an entry point that comes from the network that is affecting a processing here. So we'll see how this actually can be uncovered by means of collecting uh, security identifiers and enriching them into uh, the provenance class. By the way, the demo that I'm showing uh, can be accessible here. So there's this link, there's also this QR code. It's in a collab notebook. Uh, so anybody can go there and execute it. The traces, everything is in there. Uh, also the APIs that we extended from Sysflow, the collector that we extended is also like all in, uh, open source um, in the branches that we have. We haven't yet made it to our upstream uh, branches because we want to fix the issue with uh, the risk, how we collect uh, the, the translation to the labels. Um, but in a nutshell, yeah, if you go um, to that link that I sent and you click uh, here, yeah, you should be able to execute this in your own environment uh, in Collab. Um, so, so, but I'm gonna run here locally. Um, so essentially, I'm gonna be showing here uh, what we did uh, in terms of how we did the you know, log hunting on top of the traces that we collected uh, that has this um, you know, security labels and all the system calls like Tara was uh, talking about. So at the core of our approach here, we have this API, it's a graphlet. Uh, that essentially can um, uh, read from the data. So here you have you know, the trace that we collect. So it's it, it mounted in this data path. Um, and this graphlet class, it's all documented in here. You can read up, read later. Um, uh, builds the provenance graph from the, the sysflow traces because sysflow is a relational data format, right? So it has the linkages between the process objects, the process events, the flows, um, everything in there. So it's, you, you build the graph uh, as you read it. Um, and we also have Go APIs for those graphs. So there's a way also to build them in stream fashion. But I'm showing here is the Python API. Um, and there is a, also a way for you to define policies, right, in declarative YAML format where you can have like logical expressions on top of the sysflow attributes to uh, match against different nodes, different um, uh, places of the graph and add tagging to it. So you can actually add additional semantics. So here you note that we have an integrity policy that we mapped from the monetary access control labels or types. And we also have a TTP policies that I'm gonna show at the end what it does. Um, so we build a graph um, and here I'm just printing the shape of this graph. So meaning this graph contains under this graph, we have 11,256 sysflow records. So that you know, encompasses process events, file flows, net flows, all those things. And each of those records, they may have up to 79 attributes, right? So all the attributes that sysflow collect, so we flatten them. So, and if I you know, visualize this graph, this provenance graph, it is a huge thing here, right? So it's actually beyond, it's a lot of nodes and we can go on and on. But you know, it's all the basically behaviors that we have seen during this collection period for the entire Linux host. There's no filters in here. So it's, and it does coalesce things, right? So you have files coalesced related to this process. There are some processes that have lots of uh, child that are you know, coalesced together because they have the same behavior, but it's still, it's, it's very large. Um, the nice thing about Sysflow, because it's all relational, you know, you can take the data maps to a data frame and you can visualize in different ways. So this is another way to represent the entire host uh, data. So here, for example, let's see if I can find, yeah, there is Apache, for example, here. So if I click here, you have all the file flows associated with Apache server. You have the, the actual process event, and we also have the network behavior. So you can see here that Apache is listening and talking to those, uh, to those IPs here and you know, to those ports. So anyway, so Sysflow is nice because it, it gives you a very easy way to look into what's going on in your system from a data science perspective. But you can also go deeper and see what actual records you have under the hood. So the same data I can filter, for example, for the Apache server that we just saw. And you can see you know, the timestamps, the file flows, process events, you know, the PIDs, the thread IDs, um, you know, all the general attributes that we extracted from the system calls. And now, because we have the ability to get uh, the SC Linux labels, we also have the process uh, SC Linux labels. So here we have the HTTP exact types and also have the file types. So we're gonna use that information to essentially define integrity rules to you know, uncover multi-step attacks in this host without having to know where the attack was in the first hand. So that's the goal. So I'm gonna skip over this because Terrell will talk about this. Uh, and we define those very 
three very simple rules, right? Using SC Linux labels, like I said, the types of the binaries associated with the process and the types of the files. And basically we are looking at uh, the exact system calls and the open system calls, uh, like the file system, uh, system calls. Um, we uh, look at things that we deem to be low integrity. So for example, we look for uh, sysflow, SF is the prefix for the sysflow uh, record, file is the file object, SC label is the SC Linux label for that, for that object. We look to pattern match on any list of what we call low integrity object identifiers. So those are the types. And in this case, could be any content type that um, is served by, for example, something that is network facing, Apache, FTP, and so on. Uh, for high integrity objects, we can think about anything that you know, is more protected that you know, it shouldn't you know, receive things from the internet or things that run at higher privileges. So we look at processes that could potentially be victimized. Uh, and again, we look at the process that's in Linux labels and we look at things like, for example, Chrome D and other process that mm, shouldn't, you know, be affected by low integrity uh, objects. Uh, and here I have another rule that uh, is tagging any nodes. Oh, and by the way, th that's a tagging component that I forgot to mention. So when, when this expression matches, of course, we add this tag to, to the specific corresponding record and nodes of the graph. Um, so here on the same token, I'm looking for any classes or types of processes that are, for example, network facing, right? Um, so, and then I, I add like a label vector network. So with that in mind, let's go back to our example. I've already explained what it is, right? We have shell shock is our attack vector. Um, shell shock is indirectly affecting the execution of a higher privilege process, Chrome. There's a job in there and it's hijacking Chrome to do something nefarious. For example, upload, updating the sudoers file to give the, the, the Apache user, um, you know, basically a passwordless sudo privileges. So that's the attack. Um, so the way you define this sort of security principle, when you have this labeling system, is that instead of saying, hey, let me see if I have a TTP or indicator of behavior for you know, shell shock that somebody has extracted as a signature. No, we don't think this way anymore. Now we can think about, is there any flow for things that are deemed to be low integrity in this entire system that somehow finds a path in this provenance graph to something that in our integrity policy is deemed to be high integrity? And then what we do, we create those predicates and we say, hey, graph, find a path that connects those two things. And lo and behold, what you get, it's something like this that links, for example, Chrome D, the higher privilege process runs as root. Uh, it has the, the Chrome D types uh, uh, here um, and links it all the way to the chain of execution. As you can see, there is the, the backup script that runs and then it holds and calls that the www.html binar sync was duped into calling it as opposed to the actual uh, binar sync uh, all the way to you know going to the to that thing that was um, deemed to be low integrity which is the rsync script here that is controlled by the attack that was dumped through the shell shock attack to the file system so here you have the direct you know the indirect attack right uh, a higher privilege process that is high integrity based on the type Chrome T to that's being affected by the low integrity file, right? First security principle. And, anyway, and we could think about duals as well, like for example, information leakage would be the opposite, right? Um, and we can go further, right? Remember that we also denoted these classes of what vector facing, you know, network facing classes of applications. So we can extend our predicate to say, hey, try to find any network facing, because we are making assumption here, any network facing application that could be linked to the existence of that file, of that uh, var www rsync file. And lo and behold, you get Apache at the top here. Apache, you know, launches its children. Those are the worker processes. So you know, the provenance graph that we have, like, remember, it coalesces things that have identical or semantically similar behavior. So you don't have like four nodes with four edges, like this ever ending fan out. No, it actually coalesces. And then uh, it goes all the way to the point where you have 
the injection, the payload here. You can actually see the payload. Uh, that is hijacking shell shock. So there is a CGI process, the victim CCI process that is mapping to a vulnerable batch. It's tr to duping that batch to execute VDGP um, environment variables, basically hijacking the, that CGI process into executing bash. And then writing the file, you see the file flow? It's writing that rsync file to the file system. And see here, we have this little analysis that does the attack graph for you. So essentially, it's linking this file with the execution of the same file. So think, I like to think about this like as a dependently type sort of system, I mean, an analogy to it, where this exact after write is dependent upon the context, which is comprised by the graph, the provenance graph, and the types of the secure identifiers, uh, the labels. And because we can do this connection, then you have here on the other side, you have Chrome. And after this connection here, you know that everything else is tainted. And this is actually the behavior that we are seeing, right, where we are actually uh, altering uh, the sudoers file. So this is the entire kind of attack chain. It's a multi-step chain. It's disconnected, but because of the labels, we can bring the, everything together in a nicely way without having to do much hard coding, right, in terms of rules. So if you look past the state of the art in this, uh, things like DARPA transparent computing, right? The entire work there was around like creating systems with provenance graphs where you have rules and patterns that have to know, to be known a priori. You need to know the, the list of values, the list of process names. And in this case, you don't need anymore because you can leverage a labeling system that is already in the operating system. In this case, we did this in Red Hat 9.3. Uh, we also have rules for TTP tagging, right? Those can be false, can false positive a lot. But in this case, we got four, four TTPs in here. One thing that I'm gonna show you is that if I print from this graph here, this is G2, right? This graph that we uncovered the attack. If I print all the nodes, you can see here the node where there is something odd going on. If I print the data in this node and just project on the executable and the environment variable of that executable, you see that is in fact the bash and bash is being injected with the HTTP um, user agent. If you remember Shellshock, that was the attack, right? Against a CGI-based web server. You would hijack this variable, you would prefix it with this um, string, and then after that you were able to do whatever you wanted. It's a remote code execution vulnerability. So this is the end of the demo. But all of that was like, we were able to recover this attack for the entire, from, from just that, you know, for security principle, looking for flows uh, of, um, you know, control from the low integrity object to the high integrity objects that are mapped from the security identifiers. So, <clears throat> with that being said, this gives us a, the policy, right, that we basically had uh, in this demo, right? So, we are looking for victim uses of these resources that an adversary can potentially modify. Um, and in this work, we are actually uh, working with uh, our friends from PSU to uh, come up with this sort of integrity policy, larger integrity policy based on SC Linux for Red Hat, uh, where we have, um, you know, comprehensive uh, lists of, of, of different types, if you will, that can be used for this kind of detections. Um, so again, at system call, uh, we want to basically apply these host graphs um, to annotate attack resources, and you want to be able to log to the detection based on that. So this kind of interactions that we have through, through files, um, types. Um, one thing that we are exploring is the idea of leveraging extended attributes also to improve the semantics of the lineage. So certain tools like curl, they add extended attributes to files, so we could actually use those extended attributes for security purposes to know semantics of things. Oh, it's coming from a web browser or, or something like that. So that could also be helpful in our list definitions. Um, and back to my point before, right? Right now we have this race problem where we are creating this hash table um, in eBPF to cache from a K probe of uh, the security SID to context function uh, the labels so that we can do the mapping in user space. What we would like to do is potentially to declare or wrap this function as a kfunc so that we could potentially do the, the, the mapping directly in line as we're collecting the packages. So we don't know if this is um, the best approach, but this is one 
way that we think that could be easy for us to to do this without incurring any races or in this interaction where we have to cache things out of band. Um, could also have a user space uh, API that we could call and do this mapping, maybe. Uh, but again, we'd like to hear from the community, hear from the experts, what could be uh, you know, the best approach. Of course, a eBPF helper would be even better, more stable interface, but I don't know what's the state of accepting new eBPF helpers by the kernel community. Um, yeah, and one word about compatibility, right? Why did we do this in Core E, eBPF? Because we wanted to achieve compatibility across uh, multiple kernels, but Sysflow also support legacy kernels, right? So we also have K mods and things like that. So potentially, we could also implement this approach um, for legacy. Yeah, so this is the end of our talk. And I should probably acknowledge uh, the US Army Research Lab. Uh, part of this work uh, was done uh, when we were PIs uh, in a grant. So, any questions? Okay, this one's on. Uh, so it sounded like this is a source of many false positives and false negatives. Uh, so not sure when you would use this. Um, are, is the plan to grab some, some novel malware to, to, to understand it, to, to find where the problem is, or what, 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 is, what is the real goal with creating this? So, so the real goal is to uncover, like I said, multi-step attacks, APTs, this kind of pro, um, problems. And you're right that um, in general, all approaches that try to do that, they fall spots a lot. And, and, and this included, if you're looking at like IOBs, indicator of behaviors, TTPs, they're prone to false positives, right? Because, and so what we are trying to do here is to use an existing labeling system that a group of experts have defined already for the operating system, define those types, and then define those security principles, right, that could label potential paths that could be associated with something potentially malicious. So again, false positives. But the idea is for log hunting, right? You're talking, you saw what I showed before, like when I said, we saw the, we show, I saw that I showed the tree map, like, 11,000 nodes and things like that. So someone who is in the business of doing threat hunting and is dealing with this large amount of data, it's like very large amount of data. In Sysflow, we have 11,000 uh, records. System call wise, that would be probably two, three times more, if not more. So when you're sifting through these logs, say audit logs and things like that, how do you know? How, 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 how can you make sense of this more semantic behavior? So we're trying to add levels of semantic. And even if you have false positives, for someone who is doing the log hunting, this I think it's easier for you to you know, separate the good from the bad than look at the, you know, the very granular you know, data that you would have. And also, we are tagging things on a much higher level, coalesced. You know? So you only have one of those flows as opposed to have thousands of the same things happen for every system call that has the same behavior. So that's much more verbose, like tagging on a specific system calls is much more verbose than tagging on like those large provenance graphs. Does that make sense? So even though it may false positive, the number of those false positives will be much smaller. So yeah, um, just to add to that, one of the, the big areas of research right now is looking at how can we take these, these large provenance graphs and start the, the items that we identify within them, link them up into the kill chain to different phases of the kill chain. And so the idea there is if you start getting more you know, dots on that, that kill chain, then you're, you're more likely to have found something that, that, is, that is malicious. And so the idea here is to be able to bring that together for the security analyst. Um, yeah. And... Thank you. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the file flow stuff, I, I noticed you had, you know, you're tracking open read write, et cetera, mm -hmm. as well as you know, bytes written 
yeah. that stuff. We, um, we have a bitmap. Yeah. Are you actually tracking like bytes being passed through read and write? So we have, we have volumetric counts on the number of bytes written, read, the number of system call operations, uh, write system call operations, read system call operations. Okay. So we have an entire bitmap and also the open flags. Um, do you have any way of tracking like uh, some file operations are going to do their read and write through the virtual memory system, like via MMAP? Yeah, we do. Are those just yes. invisible? Yeah, yeah. We, we, do, we could track uh, the MMAP calls. Yeah, MMAP are tracked as well. So you know the MMAP happens, but not necessarily how much data was read. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Just, just wondering if you had a, a magic wand that you used for that. <laughs> no, or not. no, no, no. Okay, cool. No. Um, you, in the demo here, you talk a lot uh, about like you know basically detecting privilege boundary crossing yes. events. Um, uh, more recent events have showed us we are looking also now at you know behavioral analysis of say a build system that's building I don't know XZ. Mm. Um, what sorts of processes are writing to what sorts of files? Right. Um, have you tried any kind of analysis yet of that? Not yet. Okay. So so well, well actually we we have for. Uh, the, oh. the CI/CD pipeline yeah, go ahead. for yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and and so yeah, you can find some, some <laughs> don't pretty say words. Don't say words. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so you're able to like you know find things like you know people yeah. having like open passwords and, yeah. and all of this, these yeah, types yeah. of things, and really be able to to trace back where you know some of those some of those issues are in terms of misconfigurations yeah. um, it, it, and, it was, and all that kind of stuff. It was yeah, some accidental stuff, yeah. findings in CI/CD pipelines for cloud. Oh. So, but we never did like on purpose for supply chains in general. That, that was a very interesting thought. Like, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, I like this approach. Um, I was wondering, um, how do you um, store all, all the execution flow and valuable information well, the graph? How do you store it? How do you extract it from the kernel? Do you compress it on the fly? Or do you just expose a map to your space? And which format do you use? Um, in ter was it about, I didn't quite hear it. He's talking about how we build it, how we store it, where do we store it? Yeah, we... Uh, yeah, so um, so basically what we, what we do is we can, uh, each node is sort of a, is a coalescing of, uh, of a, of a bunch of records that are that are underneath it, um, and so we can actually um, decide how much granularity we want to we want to store per, per node um, based off of uh, based off of what kind of uh, storage we have. So we like to to use a lot of S3 um, because S3 tends to be really really cheap, so you, you can actually save more. Um, and um, so we'll we'll use uh, you know like databases like ClickHouse or um, Drill, which can allow you to, to to push back um, uh, to uh, to an S3 as a backend store, uh, and then essentially we uh, for storage uh, we're using these, those uh, sort of call call oriented databases, and essentially we can have sort of a higher level representation node, and then have have you know sort of sub nodes uh, um, that that are sort of mapped to, to that particular node, and you can we can rebuild uh, the graphs you know you know from that. And we have used Avro. Uh, yeah, firm. yeah, yeah. yeah we use a lot of Avro. Bin binary serialization through Avro as well yeah. for the storage. So, yeah, there, there is a yeah in the in the Cisco, uh, the GitHub project. Uh, yeah, if you're interested, you can. Yeah, we're happy to well. talk. Yeah, it, yeah happy to yeah. talk about we it. We can show you more um, where, where things are. But uh, ClickHouse has some some nice nice features where you can actually build for for uh, like subtables within a within a row. So you can have like little sort of mini subtables, and so. Um, essentially, think about each row being a little table, uh, and so we can create it where um, a row in ClickHouse is essentially all all of the the, the sub rows that make up that that node that that we coalesce in the in the in the picture in the yeah. in the presentation. Okay. And what did the um, did you measure the performance impact of re recording well all these events? Yeah, the performance impact of recording all the events. Um, yes. It, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so everything is done is, is done passively, um, and we do re recording wise, we, we we do all that um, offline. Um, I forget exactly what the percentage point is. I think it's it's a few, you know, anywhere from. It depends on the workload. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
it's, it's negligible on the processes. So if you have a large enough machine, I mean, large enough is not a big machine, um, like, you know, more than one processor, <laughs> uh, it's not going to be a, a, an effect on the process that are running the machine, right? So uh, the collector itself takes up to one vir virtual CPU, for example, one, one node. And it's all done in stream fashion. And the way we do, we serialize in Avro, and then we have a couple of ways of sending the data out. We have a stream exporter, and we also have a batch exporter that puts in that into S3. So depending on the mo mode you deploy this system, um, you're going to have you know, options on how you're going to bring the data out. Yeah. But it, essentially, no, it's, it's not a, a big footprint in the machine. Maybe a couple, of hundred, a couple hundred megabytes of memory footprint, and then up to one virtual CPU. Yeah, yeah, we tend to, so we had one um, uh, cloud installation where we actually uh, mounted an S3 as a, a, as a little um, drive that we mounted and they wanted, the, the people we were working with wanted to be able to store the raw sysflow files in there. And so we just actually, uh, in five minute intervals, would, would, drop, yeah. uh, would drop the sysflow files yeah. in there and it would get written directly to S3. So that was a yeah. way to do that. Yeah. Last question. Um, do we intend to, are you only interested by SNX or do you, did you try to use other informations um, like basic one like QAD, GID and so on or either, I know, second filters, um, eBPF programs, Linux sandboxes, stuff mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, so I would say um, we're always trying to find um, uh, you, know, you know, interesting indicators of things. Um, you know, so for example, uh, <coughs> even knowing like, you know, in a Kubernetes deployment that uh, the file is getting read off, like, you know, a Kubernetes Docker container will use a layered file system. So knowing that, you know, you've gotten the file off of the top layer tells tells you a lot, um, for example. Um, other things that we were talking about, we actually, Mimi over here, uh, we have been talking for, for a long time about incorporating things like IMA, so being able to do the hash, the hashes and things like that. So a lot of the, the, the semantic, um, you know, indicators um, uh, that sort of, you know, provide more information about those things, we're always looking for, for, the, for those types of semantic labels and, and things that can make this better. Because uh, the whole idea here is to be able to sort of filter out that no noise and really understand exactly what the program is doing. And so the more type of information that we can use for that, I, th I find it, it, yeah. it's really useful. Yeah, there's always a trade-off, but yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay, so that concludes our talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.